In the beginning, the great architect created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Having been restored to the blessing of material light, let me beg you to observe that light was ever an object of attainment in all ancient mysteries. It was then, as it is now, the symbol of truth and knowledge a fact of which we must never lose sight when we consider the nature and significance of Masonic light. When a candidate expresses a desire for light, he sees not only that light which removes his physical darkness, but also that intellectual light which brings to his view the sublime truths of morality and virtue, which it is ever the object of Freemasonry to teach. These words and ideas are taken from the ritual in the first degree in Freemasonry, a fraternity which has existed from time immemorial. In the next few minutes, let us take you through a journey which explains why in all ages the greatest and wisest of men have been promoters of this ancient and honourable fraternity. Hello, mister. Sir, are you the foreman? Yes, I am. What are you building here? It's a great temple for the king. What can I do for you? Are there any jobs going? Maybe. Have you worked on a building site before? No, but, but I reckon I could learn, especially if there's any work with stone. Well, we have some groups of stonemasons on the job. One's from France, there's one from Spain, and there's a lodge from Rome. Go and see the master mason on one of those and see if he'll give you a job. Maybe take you on as an apprentice. What do you have to be able to do? Well, if they accept you, they'll teach you how to make rough boulders into building blocks, how to shape them, set them into the building, make sure they're level and square. But in addition, They'll expect you to behave on the level and deal on the square with all the people you work with. That sounds great. You'll develop skills which will enable you to become a craftsman and finally a master mason. One day you'll be able to travel with your lodge to new countries, see the world and find employment wherever great buildings, churches, palaces are being built. How would I get work in a place where I can't speak the language? The lodge will teach you special signs give you words which will get you work even in foreign countries because the foreman or the architect on the job will know from those handshakes and words how skilled you are as a mason but even more importantly that you're honest and a good man who can be trusted in whatever you do what sort of signs well let's look at some signs and symbols in this lodge room what do you reckon that stands for g maybe god well you're right of course in Freemasonry, we recognise that there is a supreme being. In English-speaking countries, that would be God. And because Freemasonry is open to all good men, because it's a brotherhood also called a craft, which allows for any man to join, no matter what race or religion or any other distinctions, it doesn't matter whether he's a plumber or a doctor or a bus driver. We don't care how wealthy or poor he might be, but we do want our members to be decent, upright people, men who believe in a higher power, a supreme being. And to make that point, Freemasons call that the great architect of the universe. Is that his chair? No, that's the chair of the master of the lodge. Notice the carved symbol on the front. That is the square, the most common implement used by stonemasons and builders of all kinds, and used by Freemasons to remind members to act on the square to all. Freemasons use the tools of stonemasons as symbols of how we should lead our lives. Each of these has deep meanings which we teach to the brethren. 
to stress to them the great principles of morality and virtue which all good people should value in their lives. Now that stonemason's implement is called a level and it's the symbol on the front of the chair for the senior warden in a Freemason's lodge. What's a senior warden? He's the master's right-hand man and the level is a symbol which stands for equality. Makes the point that everyone in a Masonic lodge is equal. That's one of the reasons why Freemasons wear dinner suits when they go to lodge. I've seen them going to lodge, looking like a flock of penguins with their little black bags. My mates reckon they wear dinner suits to make out that they're better than other people. Well, I guess that's one of the many misunderstandings about the craft. The real reason that it was decided we should wear black ties was because, in earlier times, the wealthier members could be distinguished from the less well-off because of the clothes they wore. So it was decided that dinner suits would make all the brethren look the same. And the dinner suits also made a lodge meeting seem a bit more important than going out for a night with friends. What's that? Is that a Bible? Yes, it is. Freemasons call it the volume of the sacred law. And depending on which country the lodge is in, or which religion most of the members belong to, that book could be the New or the Old Testament or maybe the Quran. Whatever. Indeed, in some lodges, they have more than one sacred book open on the altar. That just underlines the Masonic view that a man is not judged by which particular religion he follows, but by his behaviour towards others, how he lives his life, his basic values, the essential ingredients that make a good man. Now that is what Masons call the first tracing board. The symbols you see there demonstrate what an apprentice Freemason learns in his initiation into the first degree of Freemasonry and during his early period in the craft. All those symbols, the columns, the winding stairs, the tessellated pavement, carry valuable lessons with them, and they're all designed to make good men better, which is one of the key objectives of the craft. The lessons are taught by the officers of the lodge in special ceremonies. So do you, do you have to go through those ceremonies? Yes, they're all quite wonderful events. The officers and members of your lodge perform a very moving and ancient ceremony for each of the three degrees of the craft. The new masons usually remember these occasions for the rest of their lives. Is the initiation scary? Candidates tend to be nervous because they don't know what's involved. But once they realise the good intentions of the craft and the values we believe in, they tend to relax and enjoy what they're about to learn. So, what's the deal with the goat? Let's get this straight once and for all. There is no goat. It's another of those urban myths that people like to laugh about. And it's come about because Masons have been so secretive about their beliefs and activities. In fact, that secrecy has been quite harmful to the craft. People who aren't Masons wonder what the secrecy is about. But as you know, if someone is keeping secrets from you, you suspect their intentions. Yeah, I've wondered why the Masons don't talk about what they do, if it's all so good. Well, that's part of the tradition, which goes all the way back to the building of King Solomon's Temple thousands of years ago. In those early days, and later in the early craft guilds, when there were no diplomas or other documents to prove that a mason or a carpenter had the required skills, they used the secret handshakes and secret words to distinguish the apprentice, the skilled craftsman and the master mason. Because those skills were highly prized, anyone who had them didn't reveal the secret words because they didn't want other workers claiming to be qualified when they didn't actually have the learning and the skill which the genuine stonemasons had. Today we have diplomas and other documents, but in Freemasonry we've kept those traditional secrets as part of the history. The handshakes and words are actually the only secrets we aren't prepared to tell you until you've shown enough interest to join the craft, but all that I've told you can be found in many books, in libraries or on the web. So I could get all this information without becoming a mason? You could but it would have much less meaning for you to read all that from a book or a computer screen. You'd learn about some of the great earlier Masons, world leaders, great composers. The music you heard as you came in was by Mozart, one of the most famous... Irving Berlin and Count Basie and great performers like Louis Armstrong and I think to myself what a wonderful world and Australia's Smokey Dawson was a mason too and while I'm running hot Australia had great explorers like Matthew Flinders 
Oxley and Wentworth. We had 16 VC winners. Great sportsmen such as Sir Don Bradman, Ian Craig, one of our cricket captains, Sir James Hardy, the America's Cup skipper, Merv Wood, the Olympic gold medalist for rowing, John Trelaw, the sprinter. Ten of Australia's 25 Prime Ministers were Masons. Vice regal representatives, leaders of industry, inventors, architects, doctors, and on and on. At one time, there were 140,000 Masons from all walks of life in New South Wales alone. They all saw the value of Freemasonry and gained greatly from their participation. That's amazing. Why do you keep all that a secret? Yes, you might well ask that. It's been a tradition that we don't give Masonry a hard sell. Instead, we wait until our sons or our friends ask us about it. Maybe we've overdone that too. But today we're determined to change and to stop hiding ourselves. Our members are being encouraged to talk about Freemasonry to wear Masonic lapel badges and to have conversations which we think will encourage people to ask us questions. We'll answer honestly and openly, and that will lead to new members wanting to learn more. Then if they join, they'll find there is real magic, real value in actually experiencing the ceremonies. And I can tell you it's made a difference to me in how I live my life. I think you'd get great pleasure and value from it too. One of the great things about Freemasonry is the friendships we form and the good work we do together. So what happens? Well, at most Masonic meetings, there's some serious business, like the usual things in any organisation. We keep records. There is a secretary whose job it is to keep minutes, a treasurer who looks after lodge funds, a caring officer who visits members who are sick or in need. Though Once you become a member, most Masons do that sort of thing, concerning ourselves about our brethren. Then we usually do some degree work for the new members, and afterwards we have supper. Most lodges make small charges for the meal and refreshments. We call it the South, and there's usually some fun. A toast or two, some jokes, a bit of singing, some music, entertainment nights and other social events to which ladies and friends are invited. Is there anything else I should know? There are lodges in nearly all parts of Australia, 580 of them, with about 30,000 members. And providing you're known to have a good reputation, you could join anyone you like. And then you can visit any lodge anywhere in the world and you'll be made welcome. You'll have brethren wherever you go. So even if I can't speak the local language, I could go to a lodge and hope to find someone who speaks English who could invite me in? That's right. There are 164 countries where you can try that. And don't worry, there are about 5 million Masons around the world and there's usually someone who speaks English. And whether they can or not, they'll all welcome you as a brother. And you'll be proud of the work Masons do in society. Over centuries, Masons have supported benevolence formed and operated charities. In Australia and New Zealand, we have about 100 Masonic retirement villages. People who want to live in them don't have to be Masons. They're all comfortable without being lavish and they're affordable. We have special funds for orphans, widows and others in need and the craft makes generous contributions to bushfire appeals and to other needy purposes. As you have passed through the ceremony of your initiation, Allow me to congratulate you upon your admission to our ancient and honourable fraternity. Ancient, no doubt it is, having existed from time immemorial. Honourable, it must also be, as it tends to make all those so, who are strictly obedient to its precepts. Indeed, no institution can boast so solid a foundation as that on which Freemasonry rests, the practice of every social and moral virtue. And to such an eminence has its credit been advanced that in all ages, the best, the greatest and the wisest of men have been promoters of the art. But that's enough for now. Maybe if you decide to join, you'll one day welcome other members into your lodge. The main thing is to remember to enjoy your life. Live it on the square, to help others. We see masonry as doing good and being happy. It's the pursuit of happiness, and we urge all people to be happy and confer happiness. Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful 